was a little boy, baseball meant everything to me. I played little league baseball. I collected baseball cards. Uh, back when I was a little boy, we didn't have a bunch of TV channels. We in Arizona, we had channel three, five, ten, and twelve. And every Saturday morning, there was a baseball game of the week, and I would tune into that game of the week, and I would watch every pitch, and I would even chatter like I was at the game, trying to make noise. And I lived and loved baseball. It was a very important part of my life. Um, as a matter of fact, today I start. You you've seen my office before. And I've got hundreds or even thousands of books. And I started looking at all the books that I have about baseball. Uh, one of my favorites is this story called Baseball Saved Us. And it's the story of how when people of Japanese descent, even if they never lived in Japan back in World War II, um, if you look like the enemy and you had uh, Japanese ancestry, you were placed in an internment camp. And this is the, the true story of how baseball is what one internment camp turned to to help them get through this crisis where all of a sudden even though they were americans they were placed in an internment camp kind of like a prisoner of war even though they weren't the enemy um willie mays when i was a little boy uh he played for the san francisco giants and his nickname was the say hey kid and i loved willie mays um hank aaron was the home run king and I remember clipping out of the newspaper the day that he hit home run number 714 when he passed the legendary Babe Ruth. I'll never forget that moment. I was so excited. I loved Hank Aaron. Um, Mickey Mantle was a little before my time, but oh, I was a fan of Mickey Mantle. He was a, a power hitter and a legendary player for the New York Yankees. And hit, he, when he would hit a home run, it would go so far over the fence that people would be talking about it for days. Of course, we've all heard of Babe Ruth. This story is called The Babe and I. The story of Roberto Clemente for the Pittsburgh Pirates. He was the pride of Puerto Rico. I loved Roberto Clemente. I had his baseball card from every year that he, he played. This is the story of Roy Campanella. Um, he was a catcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And he was one of the early African-Americans that played in Major League Baseball. And then, the story of Satchel Page. This one is special to me because, boys and girls, I was in the fourth grade when I read my first chapter book, and it was called uh, Maybe I'll Pitch Forever, the story of Leroy Satchel Page. Leroy Satchel Page didn't get into the major leagues in baseball until he was much older in life. He played in something called the Negro Leagues because the blacks couldn't play on the same field with the white players. There was segregated baseball like most everything else in those days. And so he didn't make it into the major leagues to play with the white players until he was in his 40s, I believe. Um, and I actually like Satchel Page so much. I have two picture books about Satchel Page. You're probably wondering why I'm talking to you so much about baseball. Well, here is why. And now I'm going to introduce our special guest. And, you know, we may have had guests on at Zaharis that more people know about. But there's nobody that I'm more excited to introduce you to than someone that there's some there's a term that adults use called a kindred spirit. Have you ever heard that before? It's where you feel like you're just so connected in so many different ways. So I've not known my friend that I'm going to introduce you to for very long, but I have no doubt that not only is he going to become part of our Zaharis family because he has a kindergartner that's going to start school here next year, but I'm sure that he um, that our guest today and I are going to become the best of friends. Boys and girls, his name is Pat Murphy, and let me introduce you to Pat Murphy. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Um, he was born in Syracuse, New York, um, went to play baseball uh, in the state of Florida, and became a highly successful manager. Um, I first became aware of him when he became a manager for the Arizona State University Sun Devils. Um, but he was a manager for the Notre Dame uh, Fighting Irish before he was a manager for the Arizona State University Sun Devils. But while he was at ASU, his teams accomplished a lot of great successes. Uh, first, in 1998, uh, Pat Murphy was recognized as Baseball America's Coach of the Year. Um, and at one point, uh, Pat Murphy was the youngest coach ever in college baseball to uh achieve 500 victories does that 
uh, still stand? I think so. Okay. Uh, four times he was the Pac-10 Coach of the Year. Now it's the Pac-12 because Utah and Colorado joined a few years ago. So now there's 12 schools in the Pac uh, conference instead of 10. But four times he was the Pac-10 Coach of the Year. And then Arizona State University, the Sun Devils went on to play in the College World Series four times while he was manager for ASU. And currently, he is the bench coach for the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to uh, Pat Murphy. Pat, welcome to Zaharis. And I'm so excited because today, Pat is actually in my office. He only lives a couple of miles from Zaharis. So he came on down. Instead of having him in his own home, he's actually in my office today. So boys and girls, I'd like to introduce you to Pat Murphy. Pat Murphy, this is our Zaharis community. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be here, boys and girls, families. It's really an honor. Um, I've heard so much about this school. I've had a chance to look at it, and I'm privileged enough to know that uh, my son will be going to school here. So I'm thrilled. Oh, we're excited too. And um, the Murphys, their their son is named Austin. So we're excited to welcome him into our Zaharis family and, and the Murphys as well. Um, we sometimes have as many as 200 of these little boxes, and we can wow. flip through. And, and then when you look and see that some of them have two, three, four people we probably have a viewing audience of about 500. Nice. Um, so we're excited to have you today, Pat. Um, before you came on, boys and girls, uh, Pat and I were talking about baseball and how it was such a, an important part of our lives growing up. It wasn't just a game when I was growing up. Everybody played Little League Baseball when I was a kid. It didn't matter if you liked it or not. All boys played, and that was back at a time when we didn't have girls playing Little League Baseball. It was just boys that played back in the 1960s when I grew up and every night we'd be up at the ballpark playing little league baseball and it was during the summertime and it was such an important part of my life growing up but Pat if you could tell us a little bit about your baseball story and and how you got interested in baseball and I, I gave a little sketch of what happened you know after your college playing days but tell us a little bit about your oh, before that though the kids are going to want to know tell us about your family your kids, they're going to want to know if you have any pets, so we're going to kind of humanize you a little bit. So first, tell us about that. Well, I'm, uh, I'm from New York. I have four children. Um, my daughter lives in Tennessee, and she's married to a baseball player. Uh, she was an athlete herself. Her name's Kelly. I have a 19-year-old son, Kai, who is a college baseball player and graduate of Red Mountain in 2019. Um, and then I have two young ones, a five and a one. I have uh, Austin, five, and Jackson, who's one. So I'm privileged um, beyond belief, and I get I, I get to see all the different uh, uh, phases go by because I've raised a couple, and now I get to do it again. So I'm honored. And they're going to want to know if you have any pets or not. We had dogs. Um, we've been moving so much. You know, my life. I lived six months in Arizona, and then we all pack up and we move to Milwaukee. And we do the baseball season, 162 games, travel around the whole United States to all the great ballparks, and come home, be back with the family when we're at home. And then after the season's over, we come back to Arizona. So it's kind of tough on them, because we're moving a little bit, but um, it's a great experience. I wouldn't trade it. Thank you, Pat. So. Share with us a little bit your baseball story, how you came into baseball, you know, the, the, the highlights that you might want to share, you know, where baseball has influenced your life. But tell us a little bit about your baseball story. Yeah, you know, I, had, I was fortunate enough to have older brothers. I had three older brothers and an older sister, and they were quite a bit older than I was. And I was always the extra just having to come and play in the street or in the backyard. And they... Uh, they tortured me pretty good. I cried a lot of days. <laughs> when I got pretty good at, at, at sports, at different sports, that we, whatever season it was, we played. And then I'd hear, because we didn't have a lot of TV or print media, I'd hear about all the great players, and I started to try to emulate those players. And um, I don't know what it was. At first, I didn't have much confidence. But then I started playing Little League Baseball and realized, because of my older brothers, I was so far ahead that uh, I could be okay. And once once I realized it was going to be okay, and I kept trying and kept trying, um, then I just I loved it. I loved being around everybody and around the teammates, and um, just going through year by year, trying to win, having to learn 
how to lose. And uh, I did that and just, it just never stop. I just keep doing it. You know, that, you just said something, Pat, that we've had some really interesting guests on the last few weeks, but you just said something that just stopped me in my thinking. Pat just said that he had to learn how to lose. You know, when we're at the pinnacle of life and everything is going great and things are working out really well, it's not hard to handle that. But what do we do when it doesn't go our way and how to respond? Can you speak into that just a, a little yeah. bit? Because we all face challenges and, you know, we don't win every time we, we, we step up to the plate. What do, you, what do you mean by learning how to lose? Yeah, you know, when you're dealing with, I, I, get, I get a privilege of dealing with the best in the world um, in, in baseball. I get to work with them every day for the last six years. And um, they go through all sorts of stuff in their head about what they want out of their career. But when they start to focus just on the process, just on the journey, just on putting one foot in front of the other and just enjoying today and being part of the game today and not worrying about what's going to happen next year, not worrying about just do the right things. Um, and if, if something goes wrong, just laugh, forget, forgive yourself and move forward, continue to do the right things, treat people great, um, and just have a belief system that are going to work out. Um, that's more important than worrying about at the end of the game if you actually lost or won. Now, everybody else puts importance on winning and losing, and I think we should, but really it's the process. It's the daily, how we go about it is more important than whether we get the win or the loss. And I think learning to lose is to realize sometimes when we lose, there's a lot to learn from it. We didn't do one of those things correctly. Sometimes when we lose, we realize this is another opportunity to try again. You know, failure is not a bad word. It's just a word that says fail forward. We can we can use that as um, something that teaches us, and we're not going to do that again. Oh, I'm not going to do that again. You know, um, so I tried too hard. I swung too hard. I didn't look at the ball. I'm not going to do that again. But it's okay to go through that. That's how we learn. Failures are a great teacher. And we can keep our attitude great, but we can always do that. You know, Pat, you and I have so much in common. I, I was about ready to introduce the term fail forward. And um, I'm starting to think that that my new best friend and I share much of the same brain. <laughs> you know, I, I think of boys and girls, I think of Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb. And he once said, I found 2,000 ways not to build a light bulb before I finally figured it out. You know, it, it takes a lot of problem solving and grit and perseverance to be successful in life. Um, you know, I'm going to share something. When I was a little boy, and I'm going to ask you your question, uh, Pat. Um, when I went to Little League Baseball and I would play the games, and back then, you know, there would be lots of people in the stands watching the, the, the boys playing Little League Baseball. But when I would go up to bat, I would hold the bat like this, and then before the bat would come, I would do this with my elbow. Morgan. Because Joe Morgan was a second baseman for the Cincinnati Reds, and that was what he would do. And then um, there was another guy that I loved because I was a big fan in, in of the Pittsburgh Pirates, and he would take the bat and he would go like this before the pitch would come. And that was Willie Stargell. And so I would go up and I would I would hear someone in the, in the stands, one of the the parents say, "Hey, there's Joe Morgan." I would look and I thought, "Yes." And now Willie Stargell. Who did you aspire to be like as a boy growing up? Um, like I said, I had older brothers, and, and we were in New York, so they're all the Yankees. And uh, so I was the Red Sox and Carl Yastrzemski, oh. and he would hold his elbow as high as he could possibly make it. And uh, look, it was uncomfortable to do. I, it's hard for me to do. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, it was Yaz, Carl Yastrzemski. And now Yaz has a son who plays for the Giants. So it's a great thrill for me to see him and talk to him. And, and he's doing pretty good, isn't he? he? He's a good player. Yeah. He's a Vanderbilt grad, smart kid, um, got a good education. And he's, uh, it's actually, it's actually amazing to see. Um, um, it's not Carl's son, it's his grandson. Yes. Playing. Yeah. You know, boys and girls, um, back when, when I was your age watching baseball, um, I remember Carl Yastrzemski was one of my favorite players, too. I wasn't a Red, Red Sox fan as much as I was a Carl Yastrzemski fan, even though my glove said Rico Petrocelli, and I think he was a third base. Third base. He started short and went to third. Yes, for the Boston Red Sox. So I knew a lot of um, – and, and Bruce Hurst is a real good friend of mine who played 
the when the ball went through um, Bill Buckner's legs, he was he probably would have been the World Series MVP, I believe, if they had won that series. So good during that series. But um, I remember when the Red Sox lost the World Series, um, they showed Carly Ostremski in the dugout. And boys and girls, Carly Ostremski had his head buried in his hands and he was just weeping. A grown man that wanted to win this game so much because it mattered so much to him. And I know that sports matter to athletes of today, but back then you'd play on one team and you might spend 20 years playing on that ball club. You didn't switch around as much. And do you feel like the game today, how do, how do the players of today, and I know you work very closely with them on the Milwaukee Brewers every day, but compare the players of today versus the players from years ago. My son, my 19 year old asked me that yesterday. Like, do you think so-and-so could have played, or you think Michael Jordan could have played, you know, in this era? You know, everything changes. The environment's different. Um, athletes are different. Everybody's bigger, stronger, faster now. But the mentalities don't change much. I was lucky enough to coach a guy that for the Red Sox, Dustin Pedroia, who lives in Chandler. He was the most valuable player, rookie of the year. They won some championships. Dustin Pedroia could have played in any era because his head was right. He thought right. It wasn't about his physicality. It was about his mentality. And his mentality was second to none. And I think that when you look at players from back then who excelled, they share in common the mentality that the players have today. The game has changed so much. What uh, the media has done, what the money has done, what the, the, the athletes and the training and the learning and uh, all the analytics in the game. I mean, it's, it's brought the game to a, a better skill level physically, but the mentality is all, all about having a great attitude, wiping away what happened in the past, moving forward, treating people with respect. Um, that's what the great ones do, and I'm, I'm lucky enough to watch it firsthand. Um, Pat, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then maybe we can do a read aloud and then talk some more afterwards if we're okay on sure. time. But you, you've enjoyed a lifetime of, of baseball experiences, um, and I know you're still creating those experiences today, but uh, from what you've experienced so far, as you look back, are there a couple of things that were goosebump moments that stand out that you think you'll remember forever that you could maybe share with us a little bit about those moments that you'll forever remember? Yeah, I, instead of sharing something that happened to me personally, I've been blessed. I've been blessed beyond belief. Um, and maybe someday I'll be able to share more of my own moments. Um, but I'd like to think of things that everybody can relate to. Um, I was in the stands when Mariano Rivera from the Yankees was in an All-Star game. I want to say 2000 and I want to say 15 or 14. Or, um, and my son-in-law, uh, Pedro Alvarez, um, he was in the, he was lucky enough to be in the All-Star game, so I think it was 14. And um, that was the, that was the game that they let Mariano Rivera in his last All-Star game, the great Yankee closer, great human being, nickname was the Sandman. They let him run out to the field by himself so he could get a huge, we were in New York, so we could get a huge ovation. And he cried like a, he was overwhelmed with, with joy and, um, gratefulness to see him do that and to be part of that in the stands everybody stood and nonetheless we were in Met Stadium oh wow and there he was a Yankee and to see the ovation and to see the love you know offered towards uh, Mo Rivera was was incredible incredible to be part of um and I was I was nothing I wasn't in the game I wasn't part of the game I was watching the, my son-in-law play I was with my family, which made it also very special. See that moment, you know, took my breath away. You know, Pat, that seems to me to really underscore the power of baseball in our lives and the effect that it's had in our, our, our country over time. Because of all the things you could have shared, the one that you shared, you were watching as a fan, not as a manager or a player. And uh, I think that's really interesting. I think there's a lot to learn from that. that Baseball can impact us even if we don't pick up a bat or place up the cleats. That it's, um, and I'm hoping that we're soon going to be able to play again. I know there's been some discussion about coming up with some creative ways. I hope baseball comes back. That'll be a nice thing to bring back into our lives, boys and girls. But um, uh, Pat has a uh, book that he's going to read to us now. 
And I love how we have guests that come on and read us stories. I know you hear from me often enough that I like to be read to as well, boys and girls. So Pat's going to read us a book that he picked out of my office called Teammates. Before I start, I just want to say, boys and girls, however old you are, you're, you're never too young to be a teammate. And that's really about just understanding and just trying to understand what the person next to you on your team is going through and uh, being respectful, being courteous and letting them uh, take their turn when it's appropriate, being happy for them when they do well um, and not being too sad when you don't get the result you want, understanding that your team needs you to go out and concentrate on the next play. So being a teammate is really important. Even when you're in the big leagues, being a teammate is number one. So I'll begin. Use my glasses here. Once upon a time in America, when automobiles were black and looked like tanks and laundry was white and hung on clotheslines to dry, there were two wonderful baseball leagues that no longer exist. They were called the Negro Leagues. The Negro Leagues had extraordinary players and adoring fans come to see them wherever they played. There were heroes, but players in the Negro Leagues didn't make much money and their lives on the road were very difficult. Laws against segregation didn't exist in the 1940s. In many places, this country, black people were not allowed to go to the same schools or churches or churches as white people. They couldn't sit in the front of a bus or trolley car. They couldn't drink from the same drinking fountains that white people drank from. Back then, many hotels didn't rent rooms to black people, so the Negro League players slept in their cars oftentimes. Many towns had no restaurants that would serve them, so they had to eat meals that they could buy and carry with them. Oh, you want to do this? Yeah, no, I can see. Good. Thank you. So that's the that's the one of the, the way cars looked back then. And that's a picture of one of the teams. One of the players, Satchel Page, that you mentioned. Um, and there's a sign in the drinking fountain that said white only. That's crazy. Crazy. There were some of the great players in the league. Okay, I got to keep my place now. I've done this before. <laughs> uh, life was different for the players in the major leagues. There were leagues for white players. Compared to the Negro leagues, white players were all very well paid. They stayed in good hotels, ate at fine restaurants. Their pictures were put on cards, and the best play players became famous all over the world. That's the picture that we showed you. Babe Ruth. Ty Cobb, Joe DiMaggio, Ted Williams. Many Americans knew that racial prejudice was wrong, but few dared to challenge openly the ways things were. And many people were apathetic about racial problems. Some feared that it could be dangerous to object to that. The Jelani groups like the KKK reacted violently against those who tried to change the way blacks were treated. General manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers baseball team was a man by the name of Branch Rickey. He was not afraid to change. He wanted to treat Dodgers fans to the best players he could find, regardless of the color of their skin. He thought segregation was unfair and wanted to give everyone, regardless of race or creed, an opportunity to compete equally on baseball fields across America. To do this, the Dodgers needed one special man. Now, here's a picture of Branch Rickey that guy that decided he was no longer gonna to tolerate this racial, racial prejudice. Branch Rickey launched a search for the, the right man. He was looking for a star player in the Negro Leagues who would be able to compete successfully despite threats on his life or attempts to injure him. He would have to possess the self-control not to fight back when opposing players tried to intimidate or hurt him. If this man disgraced himself on the field, Ricky knew his opponents would use it as an excuse to keep blacks out of the Major League Baseball for many more years. This was the guy. Ricky brought in Jackie Robinson. Might just be the man. Famous, you can watch television programs. You can, there's been documentaries and movies made about this guy, Jackie Robinson. Jackie rode the train to Brooklyn to meet Branch Ricky. When Mr. Ricky told him, I want a man with the courage not to fight back. Jackie Robinson replied, if you take this gamble, I will do my best to perform. They shook hands, 
Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson are starting on what we known in history, a great experiment. There's his jersey, number 42. At spring training with the Dodgers, Jackie was mobbed by blacks, young and old, if he were a savior. He was the first black player to try out for a major league team. If he succeeded, they knew others would follow. Initially, life with the Dodgers for Jackie was a series of humiliations. The players on his team who came from the South, men who've been taught to avoid black people since childhood, moved to another table whenever he sat down next to them. Many, many opposing players were cruel to him, calling him nasty names from the dugout. A few tried to hurt him with their spiked shoes. Pitchers aimed at his head, and he received threats on his life, both from individuals and organizations like the KKK. See a picture of Jackie in the dugout sitting by himself with a lot of his teammates uh, not sitting near him. Despite all the difficulties, Jackie Robinson didn't give up. He made the Brooklyn Dodgers team. You can see in this team photo, he's the only black player. But making the Dodgers was only the beginning. Jackie had to face abuse and hostility throughout the season from April through September. His worst pain was inside. He often felt very alone, on the road, he had to live by himself because only the white players were allowed in the hotels and towns they played in. The whole time, the Dodger shortstop was a guy named Pee Wee Reese. He grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and really rarely ever seen a black person, unless it was in the back of a bus. Most of his friends and relatives hated the idea of his playing on the same field as a black man. In addition, Pee Wee Reese had more to lose than the other players when Jackie joined the team. Jackie had been a shortstop, and everybody thought Jackie would take Pee Wee's job. Lesser men might have felt anger towards Jackie, but Pee Wee was different. He told himself, if he's good enough to take my job, he deserves it. Special guy. When his Southern teammates circulated a position to throw Jackie off the team and ask him to sign it, Pee Wee responded, I don't care if this man is black, blue, or striped and refused to sign it. He can play and he can help us win, he told others. That's what counts. Very early in the season, the Dodgers traveled to West Ohio to play the Cincinnati Reds. Cincinnati is where Pee Wee's hometown, near Pee Wee's hometown of Louisville. The Reds played in a small bar ballpark where the fans sat close to the field. Players could almost feel the breath of the fans on the backs of their necks. Many of whom who came out that day and screamed terrible, hateful things towards Jackie when the Dodgers were on the field. More than anything else, Pee Wee Reese believed in doing what was right. When he heard the fans yelling at Jackie, Pee Wee decided to take a stand. With his head high, Pee Wee walked directly from his shortstop position to where Jackie was playing first base. The taunts and shouting of the fans were ringing in Pee Wee's ears. It saddened him because he knew it could have been his friends and neighbors. Pee Wee's legs felt heavy, but he knew he knew had, had to do what he had to do. As he walked towards Jackie wearing the gray Dodger uniform, he looked into his teammates' bold, pained eyes. The first baseman had done nothing to provoke the hostility, except that he sought to be treated as an equal. Jackie was grim with anger. Pee Wee smiled broadly and he reached Jackie. Jackie smiled back. Must have been tough. Stopping besides Jackie, Pee Wee put his arm around Jackie's shoulders. An audible gasp rose up from the crowd when they saw what Pee Wee had done and was silent. Outlined on a sea of green grass stood the two great athletes, one black, one white both wearing the same team uniform. I'm standing by, by, I'm standing by him, Pee Wee Reese would say to the world, this man is my teammate. What a lesson, what a lesson. Pat, before, you, uh, before we start our program today, you were telling us that Jackie Robinson has always been somebody that you've admired. 
I have a big poster of him up in my house. Um, I just believe what he endured and how he, you know, he paved the way for other black players to play, but he also gave white players an opportunity to understand how they should act. And he gave white players an opportunity to see that they could go against um, forces to be and do what was right. And uh, I've, I've just respected him beyond belief. Um, and I've, I've, I've tried to keep up on, uh, we have Jackie Robinson Day every every year, and all of us wear the number 42 to that day. And Major League Baseball doesn't let anyone wear the number 42. Is that impactful? Can you believe that, boys and girls, that while every team has numbers that they retire, 42 is the only number that's retired by every single baseball club because of Jackie Robinson. I think that's such a cool story. I uh, remember watching the movie. It came out just a few years ago called 42. And uh, that might be a movie that you uh, could consider watching as a follow-up to this um, as a Zaharis family. Boys and girls, we're going to give you an opportunity right now to ask some questions. And this is where I have to move the computer a little bit so I can see into these little boxes. If you have a question that you would like to ask um, uh, Pat while he's here with us today, go ahead and raise your hand. This is your, your chance right now. I've been doing all the asking. Now it's your turn. So go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question. Brian Holt family. Okay, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and then you can ask uh, Pat your question. Uh, Tell him your name first. Tell him your name. Uh, my name's Jacob. How long have you been a manager? Hi, Jacob. I've been in baseball since 1982. I think that's, um, I think that's 38 or 39 years. And I've never, I, I tell people, your mom and dad might get a kick out of this. I've never had a real job. I've just always been in baseball <laughs> and uh, I'm thankful and grateful. And uh, I've always, I, I've only, I've only not been the head guy in an organization uh, for three or four years. And it's a great experience too, serving someone else. So um, I'm very grateful. Great question. Good question, Jacob. Okay, let's see, Allie. Hi, Allie, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask. I like how their faces light up and it seems that they get to ask. Go ahead, Allie. Hi, Allie. My question was, what what team are you the manager of? I'm the bench coach for the Milwaukee Brewers. It's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We've been pretty good the last few years. Our our best player, or arguably our best player, is Christian Yelich. He was the most valuable player two years ago and finished second last year in the most valuable player. He's number 22. You see him on a lot of of TV stuff these days. Good question, Ellie. Okay, Cannon Watson, you're up, buddy. Pat, do you know Connor Watson? Do I know him? He's been in my house many times. He hits in my cage. <laughs> he's uh he's a fabulous young man, first baseman at South Mountain Community College, played at Red Mountain with my son Kai. Um, I love that kid. He signed my board. When you when you come to my house to to hit on our in our batting cage, you have to sign a board. And he he signed it CW. I can see it in my mind. A great young man, right-handed hitter. Um, I think he owes me some money though. <laughs> How did my you brother. Know? It's your brother. Wow. I know your whole family. <laughs> so wonderful. Oh, that was awesome. Okay, let's see. Who else has a question for Pat? It looks like Bryn1329. And tell Pat your first name. My name is Brandon, and I wanted to ask, is it fun on the, the job? What do you do? Like, is it fun? It's really fun. Um, you know, you get to coach players, and coaching is like being a teacher. And um, but we're doing it during a baseball game and, and we prepare them to play that baseball game. And it's, we get to tra travel all over the country and, and um, it's a lot of travel. It's um, a lot of hours, but it's not hard. It's, it's a beautiful thing to do. Yeah, and it's real fun. You know, that was a good question, Brandon. Um, I sure love what I do. And there's an old saying that says, if you love what you do, you'll never work again a day in your life. 
I love what I do so much working with you boys and girls. It's just been every, every day I look forward to coming to work. And you remember when we had our astronaut on um, earlier this week on Monday, she told you to try on different things, to kind of experiment, to see what it is that you like, to try to, uh, if you want to be a doctor, to learn more about it and and to do these inquiries. So that's a good question. And, and uh, I know uh, Mr. Murphy, Pat um, loves what he does, and he's very good at it. Hey, guys, I, I want to say one thing. You know, uh, my mom passed away uh, 15, 20 years ago, and uh, but she would tell me before she died, she'd say, you know, Patrick, when you were young, you used to tell me, hey, Mom, someday I'm going to coach baseball at Notre Dame. And so I'm here to tell you I was not talented. I was not special. I wasn't really smart, smart, um, as you probably are figuring out. But anyways, uh, but I had that dream, and a lot of people told me that I couldn't do it. A lot of people say, "You'll never get to Notre Dame, um, and um, you'll never get to the major leagues." And they're going to tell you all those things. But as long as that dream is embedded in your heart, you can do other things. And it, it isn't always easy to get to where you want to go. But if you have that dream, you keep thinking about it and you keep making a reality in your mind. And when it becomes a reality in your mind, then it can happen. Thank you. That is, you guys are getting such good advice. I hope that you're making some of these things. Um, and by the way, we post all of our morning programs on our website. So you can always go back and listen to them later or tell your friends that might not have tuned in this morning. Um, let's see, I think we have time for a couple more questions. As long as you need. Okay, let's see. Any other questions for Pat? Some of your your screens, I can't see you. Uh, you don't have your video on, so in the middle, right here. Um, Gianna and Sadie, do you have a question? <laughs> yes, I do. Favorite there you go. baseball player. My favorite baseball player? Mm -hmm. I've, I've got a ton of them. I've got so many that I've, I mentioned Dustin Pedroia, and I was lucky enough to, to be in some great players' careers. The guy that plays for the Diamondbacks now, Cole Calhoun, that you guys will get to know, and Mike Leak, and Andre Ethier, Willie Bloomquist. Um, I've had some great ones. And I get to work with Christian Yelich every day. You guys know the big long haired guy, uh, Josh Hader. I get to be around him every day. Um, the guy I work with, Craig Council, played for me at Notre Dame, and and uh, he's a special guy. But, uh, my real favorite players are my kids. So when I see them play, I just get a big smile and and uh, really enjoy it. You guys are asking such great questions. Um, let's see. Anybody else have a question that they would like to ask? I'm going to flip to the next page, and a lot of times when I do this, it doesn't or it doesn't light up for some reason. I don't know why. Zoom worked a lot better, but there were security breaches with Zoom, so we had to go to WebEx. Okay, any other questions? Oh, here we go. We're getting a few screens now. Okay, Brian Holt family. Jacob, you have another question? Go ahead and unmute yourself. It's now my brother's turn. Oh, you're sharing. <laughs> How long have you been coaching? I've been coaching almost 40 years. Probably older than your parents. No, no, um, our mom's 32. Six. I mean, 36, I mean, and, and our, our dad's, dad's 51. 51. Wow. Well, your mom probably heard 32, and your dad's 51 years of wisdom, but it's 40 years in between those two. <laughs> and don't tell your mom that you let all of us know how old she is, okay? <laughs> Just teasing. Okay, maybe one more question. Okay. You know, what's really hard is I'm not seeing all the um, the screens, so I can't tell if you have, oh, there we go. Sasha Castro, hello, Sasha. 
Is it Sasha? Okay, go ahead and ask your question, Sasha. How did you get to like where you are right now? Well, um, I had people help me. I had a great coach in college that that believed in me and helped me uh, understand that I might be a good coach. I had uh, a high school coach who believed in me and allowed me to to do the things that uh, I was capable of. And uh, there's a lot of people along the way. You got to treat people good, and you got to show them that you're willing to do it. And it doesn't matter your title or your money or it just doesn't matter. It just matters that you want to be part of the, the solution. And I think I had a lot of people recognize that and they gave me a chance. And then hopefully I, I did good with that chance. Boys and girls, your questions were brilliant. Um, I enjoy being on with you every day. I want to thank uh, Pat Murphy for joining us today. Uh, before you came on, uh, Pat was telling me a story about Leroy Satchel Page. And there's a special pitch that he uh, would throw. And what was it entitled again? You know, most pitchers have a fastball, a curveball, and a changeup. And Satchel Page was a very colorful man, and he would he would talk to people and make make up stories. And he said, "I named all my pitches, and my changeup is the four day creeper, because it takes four days to get from my hand to home plate. That's how slow it is." And uh, I use that all the time with my little boy when I'm telling stories. Well, I wanted to give this to you, and I wrote a little something to Austin. It says, hello, Austin. I can't wait to meet you. Welcome to the Harris. You will do great things oh, here. Man, so that is for Austin. And one of our families, the Zacher family, um, they had uh, a 10-foot banner that we're going to put up on our fence outside. And these bumper stickers, we're going to give them to you, boys and girls, and make them available one day, where if you want to drive by, you can pick up a bumper sticker. It says, we are learners, inquirers, family, community. We are Zahara Strong. And now, uh, Pat, you and the Murphy family are part of our family, so that you get the honorary first bumper sticker. That's it's true. not like the key to Zahara, but it's the yeah. closest thing we have. So. I love it. I love it. Thank, so you, thank so you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on, guys. Boys and girls, everybody wave a nice thank you to uh, – to Pat for joining us today, and we will see you on Monday. I hope to have a uh, world famous storyteller for you on Monday. So, bye bye. Have a great weekend. We won't have a program.